Great evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the virtual round table. I am honored this evening to have my line sisters of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated here to share with us this evening. There are gonna be a few more that will jump on, but I'm, I'm thankful to have the ones that are here right now. And tonight our topic is gonna to be about um, the pandemic, the effects of, of COVID-19 um, socially and mentally on the parents, teachers, and students. And of course, uh, my line sisters, the majority of them are educators and a lot of them are parents as well. So they're gonna give us uh, all three aspects. So guys, if you've never been on before, this is an open platform. We like to um, you know, give feedback. We like to uh, you know, engage the audience. So I'm, and I'm not gonna do that much. I'm gonna let you all do it this evening because just from talking with you all, you have a lot to say. So I definitely want to provide that platform for it. And this will be put out on social media, on my YouTube page as well to be listened to. So if you all have any friends that you wanna invite, definitely feel free to send them this link. So when we get started, I'd always like to uh, open us in prayer. So if you all would give me a few minutes and let me open us in prayer. God, we thank you today for each and every person that has come here at this virtual round table. We ask you to bless right now, even the nuggets that will be dropped. We ask you to encamp your angels around us, let no hurt, harm, or danger come now. Dwell in place, each family that's connected, touch them in a special way, God. And we ask you to protect all of our educators that are on the line, even the parents, the uh, students that are connected to them, and each and every person that will come in this evening, even the ones that will view this later on. These are other blessings we ask in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. So this evening, so guys, I'm not going to um, go through and, and tell all of your titles because I don't know, you know, what everyone does. But as you start speaking, if you could introduce yourself, tell us where you're located, and then also tell us what your position is. So we're, we're going to start with um, Tiffany Curry. And um, Tiffany, uh, you can uh, go at it however you want. But again, our topic this evening, the effects of COVID-19 socially, mentally on teachers, parents, and students. So Tiffany, you can tell us uh, some of your experiences, tell us the things that uh, you're going through. And also, if you have anything helpful that will help you know, someone on the line, we're definitely here. And the floor is yours, Tiffany. All right, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Tiffany Curry. I am in my 17th year as an educator. I am a mother of two. I have a 21-year-old college student and a six-year-old kindergartner and no gap fillers, just two outliers. So I do know the parent perspective as well as the educator perspective. This is my first year as a school leader though. So it has been a lot different. I am the coordinating teacher in Lincoln Parish at Dubox School. And it has been a very challenging year already with the pandemic and then to move into ed leadership has added a lot, a lot more responsibilities to the job, but I still wouldn't trade it for the world. Let's have just introduce herself and then we'll get into the discussion after Jessica, then Nicole, then Keela. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jessica Irving Stuckey. I am currently a third grade teacher in the state of Georgia. Um, this is my 14th year as an educator. I've taught many grades, but this is my first year in third grade, and it's been a, a joy, you know, go, teaching pandemic school. That's been my, that's what I've called it all year. <laughs> um, it's been a lot, I've had a lot of challenges, um, dealt with a lot of socio-emotional um, situations with students and just trying to keep them on the same, on track and just learning and trying to still make it fun, even six, six feet apart. Um, so I guess, I mean, at the end of the day, I still wouldn't trade it. Like Tiffany said, you know, I, I have been born and was created to be a teacher and I wouldn't change it for anything. <laughs> So, well, I'll go on to the next person. Hey, I am Nicole Elmore Joseph. Um, I'm in my 18th year of being an educator, my 11th year as being an administrator. Um, 
I teach in Ascension Parish, and that's one of my daughters. That's my daughter. Um, I teach in Ascension. I'm an educator in Ascension Parish in um, Donaldsonville, Louisiana. I am the mother of um, three. I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a three-year-old. And I also have three bonus kids. I have one in college at Texas Southern, and I have um, a 13-year-old and a 11-year-old. So it's been quite an adventure um, getting six kids and making sure that they're getting the best education they can get, as well as um, working at a school where we always already deal with social emotional learning because of being at a school with high poverty, you're all going to deal with social emotional learning um, already. So the pandemic definitely added to it and increased the stress of our parents as well as our students. So I think I have a, um, it's been a very interesting year and I'll pass it to the next person. Keela, can you introduce yourself for us? We're just going around right now. If uh, you all can introduce yourself. Guys, we all went to Gramlin State University in Louisiana, in case you're wondering. So uh, we'll do Keela and then we'll do uh, Camila. Introduce yourself and tell us, you know, how long you've been an educator and what, what your okay. current position is. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, 14, 11, 12, 13, 14, 11, 12, we're, we're having a little hard time hearing you. Keela, we're having a hard time and hearing you. That was one of the reasons I didn't unmute myself. I'm a mommy, mommy, white people. Okay. Park or okay. So I'll, be, I'll be free. I'm, I'm teaching sixth grade actually this year. Uh, I'm teaching uh, sixth grade social studies and ELA, and I also have two children that are in. Um, two challenges as both an educator and as a parent. Okay, thank you, Camilla. Okay, are we just saying our name and what we do? Yes, and then Tiffany Kerr is going to open it up after that. Okay, great. Sorry about uh, the delay in getting on. I just finished another Zoom. Hey, everybody. I know. Sorry, y'all. Um, my name is Camilla Antoine. Hey, y'all. Hey. Um, I am a social emotional academic development coordinator for San Antonio ISD. Um, so my job is, I used to be a school counselor, so it's kind of school counseling on steroids. We are specifically designed to develop curriculum, uh, professional development, um, to specifically target social and emotional learning and how it impacts academic development on our students. We are a all high poverty Title I school district in the heart of the lower um, the lower income areas within the city of San Antonio. And so, yeah, I get to create programs, create and bring in, um, you know, lessons, all, all of that for the students, as well as the adult wellness and staff members within our school district. And so, yeah, COVID has been very real, very busy, very crazy, uh, but unfortunately it's part of what we're all experiencing right now. Uh, Ebony, uh, Ebony, I think Ebony came on. Can you introduce yourself for us? Tell us how long you've been teaching or educating. Ebony Johnson, Barry. <laughs> I'm okay, here. We'll come back. Okay, uh, we were just uh, introducing ourselves. Um, let us know where you're located and how long you've been in the educational system, your position. Uh, I am in, I guess, Kennedale, Texas, or probably better known as a Fort Worth, Texas to most people. Uh, I have been in the education system. I believe I'm completing my 16th year. No, my 17th year. I kind of lost count, but somewhere between 16 and 17 years. And I'm currently serving as what my district calls the post-secondary specialist 
which basically means I am all things career, college, military readiness. Um, so anything that prepares students for post-secondary success, life after high school graduation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you each and every person for introducing yourself. So Tiffany, you can get started. And guys, anywhere uh, in here, if you all want to jump in and kind of piggyback or go after a person, it's definitely an open platform. So Tiffany, you can go ahead and get started. So when Kaya first called and talked to me about this opportunity and the topic, the first thing that came to mind, because it's a statement that I almost despise, is that kids are resilient. No, they're not. Because if they were resilient, we wouldn't have so many childhood traumas that transfer over into our adult lives. And we as adults need to be more in tune and allowing our children, this is just some Tiffany Curry beliefs, allowing our children to express themselves now more than ever. Because just like we're losing our parents, our friends, our cousins, so are they. And they don't know how to deal with their emotions. And if we don't allow them to express themselves and to teach them how to manage themselves, how will they ever learn? And when will they ever learn? And those things transfer over into the classroom setting. And with the pandemic, it's been harder and harder. There's been a lot of students who need that social interaction with their peers and sitting six feet apart in pre-K is not fun. The school I work at, we're pre-K through five. And our pre-K through second graders are required to wear masks, but our third through fifth graders are required to wear masks. And so, but everybody is still six feet apart. That's hard for little kids. Our five-year-old kindergartners, they don't understand why can't we sit next to each other and read the same together? Why do I have to sit at this one table all day and keep getting all this hand sanitizer all day? They do it because kids, do want to follow the rules, they do want to be respectful, but it's definitely not ideal for the development of early childhood for sure and for the social interaction of other students. Camilla, this is your expertise, so feel like just chime in at any time. And it's not just our discussion, so any persons on here can feel free to chime in because I saw some other heads nodding and agreeing as well. I'll chime in and say, I mean, yeah, socially it's, we, I think we can all agree that, that the whole idea of social distancing, that that's an oxymoron in and of itself. <laughs> uh, we try to often say physical distancing because it's hard to socialize the way the kids typically socialize and do it in a way where they're distanced. Um, I had to sub at a school because part of uh, the initiative, at least in Texas, is that we cannot shut the whole schools down anymore. Um, you have to figure out a way to make it work. So we had a situation where one of our pre-K campuses, now mind you, my, my most com comfortable area of expertise is secondary, which is your sixth grade through 12th grade, mainly high school. But I have had some time that I worked um, at one time at, a, at an elementary school. Anyway, there were, we had so many staff members out at this particular campus that because of COVID, um, whether they, were, they themselves had it or through contact tracing, they made the whole grade level for pre-K stay home. So they started bringing in district people to cover these, you know, this for the day. So I'm like, oh Lord, a whole day at this pre-K school, I got two masks, I'm double masked, like boom, right? I'm like, I'm ready. I got my, I did had a fanny pack on because I knew what like they like to touch and they like to feel and you know, they're little kids. And let's just say there was not a whole lot of social distancing happening. It was baby, pull your mask up, pull your mask up. Mask kept coming down off their faces. They were wanting to touch. I watched one of them wash their hands with no soap. I'm like, no, 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 you gotta go back. <laughs> you gotta turn around and go back. So just, you know, to echo everything uh, that Tiffany is saying all the way to, you know, when I was on a high school campus watching a kid, I had to keep reprimanding him because he had his mask down and they're in a circle. It's a group of seniors. 
there's talking, 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 and I'm like, pull your mask up. I really feel like we spend a lot of time policing it. I don't know if anybody else probably feels the same way, but a long story short, a few le months later, the kid ended up with COVID um, ex in addition to two people that he hung out with. And so just trying to, you know, get them to understand the severity of all of it and not make it such a scary thing is also a challenge. And so um, I, I think nothing could have prepared us for this. <clears throat> and I don't know when and when it will ever look different. So that's just my take on it. I'll chime in. Um, I, like I said, I teach third grade. And like you said, it's like policing all day. Put Cover your nose. I, I, I walk around and do this all day. <laughs> like, and they know that that means cover their nose, cover their nose. But I think what's also heartbreaking is, you know, prior to pandemic, we all are not educators for the money. <laughs> we're educators because that's we're, we have a calling and that's what we enjoy doing. However, what broke my heart a couple of weeks ago, um, I gave a writing assignment and the writing assignment was on a story. They had to write a narrative on a story. And when I collected the journals, you know, one of my little boys in the class, his whole narrative was about how much he hates school. And I think that, and when I sat down and I talked to him about it, you know, I was like, you want to have lunch with me today? So, you know, he was excited. So we had lunch. And one thing he said was, I'm sick of school. I'm sick of all this work. I'm sick of this mask. I'm sick of this um, sanitizer. I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of not being able to hang out or we can't do group work. I need group work because I need help from my friends. <laughs> like, so, you know, it's just so, like, like you said, Tiffany, it does affect the students a lot more than we give credit to the students um, for, you know, I try to, um, it's hard to social distance in my class. I have 22 third graders and I am the only face-to-face -face teacher on my team. So it's hard to social distance. So to me, since we're not social distance anyway, I heard that little boy and I said, okay, we're doing group work. <laughs> we're doing this. We're doing that because we're not social distance anyway. So why not go back to how we did things before with learning teams and different things and you know, I just feel bad for the kids because even as a teacher, it's, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> There's no excitement in it anymore. And it's like, oh, we're just here because they said we have to be here. And I'm sick of sanitizer too. <laughs> so that's my take on it. I'd like to chime in. I teach kindergarten in Texas. And so I'm in Houston and I have 18 in-person children and five, now five, um, virtual students and I teach both at the same time I have been all year we started in September and I have been um doing the blended model all year you're on mute you're, yeah you're muted we lost you oh okay so for me I kept asking our administrators you kept you keep saying we're social distancing however uh you keep putting kids in my class like at what point do, cause six feet is not even a thing in my class. Like now I can do three, but that's not really plausible either. She made us move our rugs. We had to put our rugs in the corner cause they couldn't sit together. Then all of a sudden the rules change. Well, if they have their mask on, they can be in a group for 15 minutes. So now you can pull small groups because we want this work done. So it seemed like it started being small conveniences for the school. And so I just finally gave up. I'm like, you know what? We're getting ready to do all kinds of groups. We're going to sing because they said we couldn't sing. I teach kindergarten. They have to sing. That's how they learn. So they were telling me we could, they are not allowed to sing because that, you know, projects the, the saliva and everybody's going to catch it. No. If it's convenient for you to do it for 15 minutes, we're going to sing all day long. So we sing all day. We play all day. And I do this all day, too, to my five-year-olds. But at the end of the day, you know, I will say that this has been a year that has never been like any other, but I haven't had as many colds. I haven't had as many sick kids because they are doing the mask, whether they're doing them right or not, they're doing them for the most part to the best of their ability. I find myself with my mask down sometimes because I'm trying to teach a child how to say a sound and you can't see the sound with my mask on. So I have to pull it down. 
And, you know, then I have to remind myself, oh, I forgot to put my mask up. Let me put my mask up. Let me do a mask check. And it is a lot of policing. But at the end of the day, I had to finally say, you know what? I'm just going to choose kids first. And once I did it, it gave me a lot of calming myself. And I noticed the shift in my classroom, too, because the kids felt free to actually be five. I guess I'll try. Um, um, I have a student um, that's in my class. I, I call him the mask police. His own anxiety kicks in. And if anybody's mask dips like this, he is on it. And I'll be like, I'll be backing him up. You know, I'll be like, y'all better listen to Jackson. Jackson know what he's talking about. Pull your mask up. Pull your mask up. And again, I had some students who, um, I guess because of um, things parents are saying at home, um, it's not real, especially early on, like it before Christmas and stuff. Um, feeding kind of into it, it's not real, not believing it. And of course, a couple of them contracted COVID as well. Um, I have one student, I was talking to her the other day, and it was kind of heartbreaking because I've experienced it. And when I experienced it, I had a loss of taste and smell. And it came back somewhat, but it still hasn't come back fully. I don't think it will, um, just because of what I've been reading about. And the student uh, told me, she said, "Miss Cook, I thought it was just me. And she explained that the same thing was going on with her and how she tells her mom, uh, don't even waste the time to fix some of her favorite foods because she won't even be able to taste it. So even with things like that, from an 11 year, I'm 43 and having to deal with it and knowing, it, you know, it's kind of difficult, but she's 11 and having to deal with like, forget it. Don't even worry about cooking it because I'm not going to be able to taste it. So yeah, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. I like to, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to say playing devil's advocate because I hate using the word devil, but uh, just to, I guess, give a different side and not to say that it's a whole lot uh, or as many as of those students who need the in-person. But one of the things that that caught my attention is before COVID. Uh, so I guess this was before March of last year. I had students in my classroom who would come every day and do absolutely nothing. I had students that may come every other day or a few times a day, and they had many, many absences and they would fail. They would fail my classes. But as soon as COVID hit and they were able to work at their own pace with online assignments, those same students that were doing nothing were now acing my classes with flying colors. We're now working on uh, programs. Uh, we use something called Edgenuity. And if any educators are familiar with Edgenuity, Edgenuity is not easy. It's a high level of reading. And then of course the students have to almost comprehend on their own and matriculate themselves through the programs. And these students were acing and getting through these programs way before the deadlines. And so while I know that in-person uh, teaching in-person education process, the old school way that, you know, having, having our kids come face to face is definitely a necessity for the majority of our students. I sometimes wonder, are we gonna forget about those students who this opportunity or this option to be virtual was a blessing? And so COVID was a blessing for them because it allowed them to be in their own space and excel or it allowed them whatever was keeping them from coming to school, now it doesn't prevent them from doing well in school because they don't have to choose. Um, and then just, I had one student that came in person to take a TSI test and he said, you know, Ms. Barry, I'm so glad I was able to choose social, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to choose virtual. He said, because, you know, I didn't have to worry about the bullying and the people looking at me funny and, you know, I know I'm considered weird, but I didn't have to worry about anybody treating me like I'm weird. I could just come into my space, come into my desk, do my work, turn it in, uh, think and analyze however long I needed to analyze without worrying about people looking at me funny because I was taking too long. And so uh, COVID has been a hot mess. It has. It's been hard, you know, but in, in spite, God has turned it into such a blessing 
in so many ways. And, and that being one of them, that there are students who the option to be virtual was an opportunity for them to succeed. And so I guess my, my, my future wondering is, will those people who have control over this see that and allow those students to continue to be successful uh, because they are the few, they, they're the mi minority when it comes to the big picture of everything. Ebony, that is true because my own daughter who is a senior, she, she, does, she has an IEP, so she's kind of struggled through school. But when they went out on, when they went out virtually, she went from a CD student for the last six years of her academic education to she's been on the honor roll <laughs> since last March. <laughs> So, I mean, now she's back in school, but in person, but she, and she still has maintained her honor roll, but that is true what you're saying. You know, she did so much that this is the first time ever that she's ever made honor roll. And you're right. She was able to do it at her own pace. So I definitely agree with that statement. <laughs> uh, Ebony, I'm glad that you brought that up. I wanted to shift right here and ask you all, uh, I don't know if, uh, I know Ms. Um, Ms. Ricks is teaching both. Uh, are there any of you on here that are teaching both? And talk to us about the, uh, the grades before COVID and then now the grades after COVID um, virtually, you know, how are the students doing and then how are they doing in person now that we're back? And anyone can go first. So I'm not a teacher. I don't. Uh, I don't teach. However, I support um, a lot of teachers. And so, at the start of the school year, I was actually uh, on a campus as a high school counselor. And what I can say to that, um, and to to what Ebony said as well, I, I agree. With same thing. What Jessica said. There always are a few kids that do thrive and do well um, in a virtual setting. Uh, but to speak on grades, I can certainly tell you that our failure rates are crazy. Like, the, it's, it's bad. It's really, really bad. Um, and the district that I am at is, is hybrid. It is the teachers do both. They do in person and remote at the same time. They got the teachers swivel cameras so that the cameras can move around as they move around. Uh, but the reason I know about the failure rate is because as a counselor a part of, as, at a high school, a big part of what we do is graduation and making sure that kids get credits and make sure that they're able to achieve all of that. And so um, I would get lists, like ridiculous lists of we need you to call all of these parents. We need to call all the, and I would spend my day literally sometimes all day calling, asking why they're not turning in work, why they're not, are they having problems logging in? Um, what, what is the reason why they are missing all these assignments? Because the teachers were teaching. They didn't have that time during the day to make all those phone calls. And then it was, you know, we were really trying to just back them up because they would say, hey, you know, I tried calling this parent. I'm talking, we get emergency contact uh, info. Like now I'm calling your sister now I'm calling your auntie, now I'm calling. And I, you know, I had one lady say, ma'am, I don't even know that family. I don't even know why I'm on their emergency contact card. I'm sorry, ma'am, you're listed. Uh, but we would have to call and call. And then social workers would have to do home visits. The administrators would have to go knock on doors. I don't know if Nicole and them have to do that, but they would have to go knock on doors because not only were they not passing, but they were not logging, they were not attending class. Um, and so I can, again, tell you as for here in, in San Antonio, it is not a good thing. Like overall failure rates are through the roof and um, it's just not a good thing. So teachers, y'all can maybe shed some more light, but I know I spent days making phone calls to failing. Camilla, I, I know our district. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Our district I, decided um, that um, we had to turn in paperwork in the beginning of the uh, January, stating the students who were not performing academically. And those parents were then responsible for getting paperwork from a physician stating that their child had an actual medical reason for being home due to COVID. So they sort of forced their hand and it was like a whole big process if they did want to send their kid at the end of the day, if they didn't want to send them, they didn't have to, but they would have to jump through a lot of hoops to prove 
that they weren't going to send them or why they weren't going to send them. And, and they were, and we got a lot of the kids to come back because they were just at home because the parents didn't want them home. But those that were failing, they made them provide proof of actual, you know, some type of physician doctors know saying that this child can't be in school because he has a medical condition that could possibly put him at risk if he caught COVID. So that helped us in our school district in Houston. Um, so like, the- uh, Tiffany, I, I think it was Ebony uh, who said not to say devil's advocate, but to play the flip side, you do have students. I know even in sixth grade that are almost taking advantage of COVID in a sense. I mean, thinking back to, I guess, what happened last year and saying that, well, I know last year, you know, it didn't count. Last year, uh, we kind of pushed everybody on. And so I do have like a group of students because I teach one class that's hybrid. Well, no, they're not all in person. And then I teach another class that's hybrid about maybe about 13, 14 in person. And then about maybe six or seven virtual. And all year I've had maybe about five to seven kids who consistently will not log on. I reach out to their parents, they will not contact, and it's like pulling teeth. And at this point, they're in a position where they, no matter what they do, they won't have enough quality points that guarantees that they'll move on to seventh grade. You know, so now these, like Camilla said, these are the conversations that are now being had. I'll be making phone calls this week, pretty much letting them know your child needs this grade in order to move on um, to the next level. So uh, it, it's a, like I said, it's a lot of different things uh, going on. You have those kids that are doing better as Jessica and um, Ebony were also saying because they move at their own pace. And then you have some that I think will do well regardless it doesn't matter if they're online in person, they're gonna do what they're supposed to do regardless of the situation. So like I said, yeah, lots of different things. I know for the school district I'm in, uh, in my personal school, we're having issues with our seniors. Like I have about five seniors who will not graduate only because they didn't come to school this year and refused to come from getting the parent liaison on to make home visits, Camilla, I do not do home visits because COVID is real. And in the district, in the area where I work, the kids don't wear masks in the area unless they're in school so COVID is real I've tried it already I'm not doing it again so but I do have a parent liaison and she is amazing so she does go knock on doors for me and I still have about three of them who I have not laid eyes on the teacher has not laid eyes on this year and they may only need two to three classes to graduate um and it's like what else do you do I sent you know, community members who I know who are very engaged in the community to go look for these kids because I would hate for them to lose the opportunity to get a high school diploma on simply because they're not doing anything at COVID and don't have the parental support to do those things. Um, one of the things that I can say is um, it's allowed my students who are virtual to work. Like I have students who are actually working because they have to work during the school day, but they are doing their work in class. So it's giving them an opportunity to help support their families and um, because adults don't want to work because they're getting their um, their uh, unemployment. So I have that other end of the spectrum as well. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing this in their district, but I know for mine, um, there's like a lot of um, intervention programs that's usually in place for those struggling students. And what I've noticed, and it actually upsets me, is that we don't have any of those programs in place this year. So it's like if you have a child that's extremely low, that needs that intervention, RTI, different things like that, and they're not getting it, according to my district, we're not holding anyone back. And I think it's just really upsetting because I have kids in my class that should be on a, let's say, just throwing it out there, a level Q reading level in the third grade, and they're like on a G or an H. You know, it's like, 
It's like, you know how we have the Generation X, we have the Millennials, like this is going to forever be considered the pandemic era, <laughs> the generation of the pandemic or COVID pandemic. And it's sad because I have out of my 22 kids, I know for sure at least eight of them are not ready for fourth grade, but there is nothing <laughs> that I can do about that. <laughs> I just apologize to the fourth grade teachers <laughs> before they get there. I'm apologize to you now because it's not my fault. <laughs> and speaking of interventionists, last school, well, the last five school years, that's what I did for the district. I was a reading interventionist. And after COVID, that was one of the positions that we eliminated here in this school district. And so sadly, that is the case. And teachers have been asked to complete their own RTIs, but yeah. And it's rough. Going on. <laughs> it's hard to complete your own RTI and still balance curriculum and instruction and, you know, different things. It's even hard to just get a regular small group because it seemed like everything is just so rushed today. It's like you get there at 715 and before you know, it, it's two o'clock, like it's time to go. <laughs> and it's so many things that you can say that you did not get to. And it's like, I feel bad for the kids that are not ready for fourth grade, but I'm not, I'm in no position. I'm just a teacher, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not in no position to say, okay, this child doesn't need to go to fourth grade. They're like, they're just passing everyone. Are they not putting any, um, plans in place to like extend the school year to have those kids do any re any remediation over the summer they have put in place where they are doing um this district-wide summer school and they're doing it for the entire summer but here's the thing with summer school you guys know that nine times out of ten the ones that need to be in summer school are the ones that don't go to summer school <laughs> You know, they can't make the parents sign the kids up. So it's like, we're talking about kids who I probably, I don't even know what their parents look like. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about those kind of children, parents, children that come from homes where the parents are not involved at all. It's like, here, take my kid, just make sure you feed them two times, please. And then make sure you get on that bus. <laughs> so it's- Stuffy, it's I'm sad. glad you- I'm glad you brought that up. I talked to a few um, individuals when I was just telling you all about it. And I want you all to talk about what about the students that were already struggling, that hated school, didn't want to go. Now they all of a sudden went virtual. And, you know, it only takes, what, 21 days to create a new habit. Where is the mindset of these individuals? Have they returned back to school? Um, is the, are the parents being active with getting them back in? Let everybody scratching their head. Anybody can go. Y'all go ahead. <laughs> they ready. <laughs> hey, so I think that you got two types of parents. And I get what you're saying, Jessica, about the summer school thing. But we also, I also have parents that are like, I'm tired of these kids being home and they ready to send their kids back. Like get these kids out of my house because they driving me crazy. So there's that as well. Um, but as far as the kids who were already struggling, you know, I think if, if, if depending on the, the child, right, if it's somebody like what Ebony was saying, whereas the student didn't like getting bullied, they were socially awkward, and that was just not the best environment for them, I think um, uh, Aviance mentioned it before, right, there's some districts that are looking at next year offering another virtual option for kids. That's my uh, personal opinion. I'm like, I could see schools offering a virtual option, a virtual campus for kids that do well with that moving forward. However, I think if it's a child, whether it's virtual or non-virtual, if they were struggling before COVID, they have ghosted us uh, pretty much. <laughs> like You can't find them. And it's, it's going to be a huge undertaking for these districts to go out looking for these kids. Like Nicole said, you do have to really send out search parties to figure out where these kids have gone because it marks against a school when you lose, you know, for lack of a better term, you lose a child, right? So that is like a dropout, especially at the high school level. That's a dropout if you cannot track down where that student went. And that is not good for, um, for the school district's ratings as well. So um, I think that, yeah, if they were already hard to find, it's even harder. So you got social workers, parent liaisons doing home visits, really trying to track these kids down to see what the deal is. 
you know, you I do agree that you do have those two type of parents, um, Camilla, because I do believe that my class is full of those that how ho those households where the parents are like the most of them don't work and they're like, but let, guess what? You're not sitting here with me all day. You're eating too much. You're in my face too much. You have to go. However, when the child comes home and they have work or something like that, the parents are not helping them. My district did offer a virtual platform. They're going to um, offer the same type of platform we have this year. I don't really care to teach virtual. I don't like it. I, I just, I can't stand it. Um, so I have still opted to be a face-to-face. -face. Thank God I have not contracted COVID, but I have been face-to-face -face the whole entire time. I just need to see them. I need to be able to touch. I need to be able to be there. Um, and that's for my sake as well as theirs. But I just wish um, some of the parents understood the severity behind the, their lack of involvement. If the parents don't care, the child is not going to care. You know, my kids, they care because they know if they come in here with something or we get a phone call that's crazy, you know, that it's going to be a problem. But some parents don't care. They like, oh, whatever. He don't act like that here. <laughs> So I do, I do understand. Well, they treat the school like babysitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had one, I have one student and at the point, at the time she was pretty much failing every core subject. I teach two of the four subjects. So I know she was failing those two. And I believe she was failing two other subjects and it was the midway point, like after the first uh, semester. And so I called her mom and had the conversation, you know, she's in danger of failing for the year. Dot, dot, dot. Her mom told me if the be now her mom works from home, but she told me if the behavior continued, she would, she might have to make her, she might have to make her sit in the room with her when she's working. If the behavior continued, I just told you the child was failing and it's still failing everything. And she's one that honestly, if, if they, I, our district is so reactive versus proactive. I have no idea what's going on. So I don't know if they're pushing everybody forward or if you know there are gonna be retentions. I have no idea, but if they want my input, that would be one that I would say would need to be retained because like she really has no clue. I have kids who like, you know how you put the work for the parents to pick up because they're virtual students or whatever. We're in the book for unit three and I have parents like, yeah, uh, when can she come and pick up that book? I'm like, ma'am, um, there's no reason to pick up that book. That was unit two. We're in unit three. Um, I don't know what to tell you. So yeah, it's, that is, I guess, it. Ex I was telling Kaya this before, that exposes to me a lot as far as what the district and what the school systems really provide for children. Like outside of them being students, just what they provide, the support they provide for children in general, when that parent, unfortunately, that parent component is either missing or lacking in some way. And y'all, I really think for, for, for some of our parents, they can't do it. Like they don't know how to do the work because they're saying, oh, that's new math and that's new things. We just need you to get your kid in front of the computer so we can do it. But because they don't know how it is, they really don't, they don't know how to support their kid in doing their schoolwork or doing the work. I know with our district, we're uh, synchronous, so our our teachers are teaching to at home and in person, and parents are supposed to be supporting them, but they can't support the work that they can't do, and that is a big concern. I agree with what everyone has said. One of the many hats that I get to wear is also the technology coordinator. And so when school first started and we were sending home all these Chromebooks and for all these virtual students, and it was every day I was outside teaching the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and the cousins how to log on because they didn't have the technology knowledge to even log on for the kids. But they were calling the school saying, well, we try, we try, we try. And then our school is in a very rural area. So I need you to go get that free hotspot from the school board. Because I can say our school district is providing the supports that the parents need. Our students can still come and pick up breakfast and lunch if they're virtual. We provided a free hotspot for you. Now, the amount of times that they have to come up to that school to pick up work, 
I think is ridiculous. Just send your kid to school, but to each his own. We did, I did have the opportunity to do a little virtual school with my boy because we had to quarantine. And I said, oh no, I don't know why parents doing that. He only in the kindergarten. And we really had to be on there from like eight to two. And we really had to do work. And it really was a lot. And so I was like, why wouldn't parents just send their kids to school? Because we weren't sick. So at first I was like, oh, we can, you know, I still can do some stuff for work and I can help him because he's kindergarten. No, it wasn't like that at all. In the first day, the technology coordinator who has given all this wonderful advice, so calm and with a smile to all these parents, so it's all you have to do is we missed the first day because we couldn't log on. And so when I went back to work, I was able to report to the district, like, if those kids really try to log on like three times a week, they deserve to pass. <laughs> and so, because it is hard and my child has the support, but I was ready when we could go back, like, yes, we back. Take us off the virtual schedule. So if the parent support isn't there for the virtual, it's definitely not gonna work. Yeah, I definitely agree with the part um, where, she's, where um, Ms. Joseph said that there are lots of parents who have no clue. Like Tiffany said, there are grandparents who have never even had a computer who are having to now touch computers. Like I had one mom, it was the first couple of weeks and I'm on camera at that point, it was like 18 on camera and five in class. And she goes, she's red in the face and she's so angry. She said, Miss Rex, every time I push that X, I just lose you. I lose you every time I push the X. And she was so frustrated because she kept logging out. You push the X, you go out, duh. And I'm thinking, duh, but at the same time, you know, you have to be professional. And so I said, well, ma'am, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you. So I showed her, I said, you're pushing this button here. She was like, yeah. And every time I press it, you just disappear. And she was so angry and the kids sitting there. So they're feeling that, that anxiety, that anger, you know, they're anxious too, because they're like, mama's mad grandma mad. she's a mama and a grandma because she got two kids in kindergarten and so I had to sort of walk her through you don't push this x because it's gonna kick you out every single time you push it that's why you lose me just push the little line and she was like oh okay I, she said well actually she said in front of all the 18 virtual and five online well I'll be damned and you know those are some things you can't help either and I'm like yes ma'am and so then I showed her how to minimize. Then the next day she was back on and she was upset because I can hear you, but I don't know where you're at. You're missing. I can hear you, but I can't see you because she had minimized me. I was at the bottom of the screen and she just didn't know. So it's a lot of teaching that we're not just doing for the kids. We're teaching the parents. Shoot. And like Tiffany said, we're teaching ourselves because she had all the great information for everybody else. But then when it was time for her to execute, I've never had to do a Zoom. You know, we Zoom is new to everybody for the most part, not unless we were all in big businesses before, but this is 26 years for me in education. I've never done a Zoom meeting. And so learning alongside, like building a plane as we fly has been one of the things that we've been saying all year long. That's what we're doing. We are flying a plane that we are building in the making. Everybody hold on tight. That was a like good that. one right there. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> Listen, that, that, was, that was real good. I'm going to ask each and every person to put on a different hat. Let ma The majority of you all are parents, and this is not just for the Zetas. This is for anybody that's on here. You're a parent, and you're dealing with this. Let's talk from a parent perspective. Let us know what is your what are you dealing with, you know, helping your child? What is your child going through? Uh, anyone can go. I'll, I'll share. Um, I had a roller coaster ride <laughs> big time. I have a six year old who started first grade, dual language first grade online during this pandemic. So he's my um, ongoing kid, love to socialize. So it was a disaster for him. At the time, I was home working. I thought I was going to be superwoman and be able to handle this and be able to navigate between him and my 11 year old. Um, but yeah, we struggled the first couple of weeks. He was in tears. 
um, you know, my biggest fear for both of them, especially the little one, is that since he had to start online, um, that he's behind, I feel. And, and the teacher has said that he's behind. Um, you know, there was times I did hospice at the time. I'm a social worker. And so I would I had a patient dying. He's pulling on me crying because the computer done logged out. I'm trying to help my family and I'm running there trying to help him. So during all that, we got kind of through that. And then I had to get a new job during the pandemic and I had to work in person. And so I had to take them to the essential workers program. They was in a room with, a, I don't think it was a teacher though. I think it was just somebody in the room with them making sure they was online that was a disaster for my oldest because he was like, I'm stuck. He almost felt like he was in prison. He like, I'm in jail. His teacher said he was logging off, wasn't paying attention. So then he started getting behind. So then finally I was like, I'm sending y'all back to school. And so they've been doing well, seem like they're getting back. And then a kid comes to school with COVID and now they're home again. <laughs> And having a new job, of course, I got to take all this time off from my new job and then try to homeschool again. And I'm worried about my kids falling behind. That's my biggest fear. You know, I know the teachers, I admire teachers are working so hard to do this, but I'm looking at my kids like, you used to be able to write your name better than that. Like, why are your handwriting not as good as it used to be? And, you know, my brother, he's a foster parent. He has 10 kids at home from, yeah, 10 foster. He got his own kids and then the foster kids with behaviors. And I know all those kids are behind because it got to a point that he got so frustrated. He was like, we going to the park. Like they wasn't even, he's those, he's those parents that y'all was talking about. They went online. I would call me like, how y'all holding up? We at the park. I'm like, how you at the park at school? You know, he's like, I got three first graders and I got a fifth grade. We don't know what we're doing. We gone. We not been school. So I'm just like so scared for these kids that, you know, I'm like, what are they going to do when they finally get to the grade and the teacher get look at them? What's going to happen to our kids when they say, you know, you reading at second grade, but you in fourth grade. You know, my my nephew got speech problems and I and, you know, he was in speech therapy, but he ain't had speech therapy for like a year. But they forward him on to fourth grade but you can't even talk clear, you know? So those are my fear as a parent, like even looking at my own kids, you know, I'm gonna work on the summer, I done pull some books and stuff to try to work through the summer, but what's gonna happen with our kids? How far behind are they gonna be? I'm in Arizona, we got one of the worst education systems here already. I got my kids in good schools. I drive 30 minutes to make sure they go to one of the best schools, but it's Arizona, so it's not the best. <laughs> so I'm already feeling worried about it. So that's been our roller coaster ride it's still a roller coaster ride here I commend all you educators um I definitely thank you for all that you do um but it's hard it's really hard for us parents out here trying to keep our jobs and make sure our kids are learning at the same time they logging off when we don't know they logging off or playing Roblox when we don't know they playing Roblox and they supposed to be in class and it's a nightmare I can't do it <laughs> I can't Well, um, hey, I'm Marla, everyone. <laughs> I know I got my camera off. I'm gonna turn it on for a minute so y'all can see what I look like. <laughs> but um, I guess for a parent like me, um, my child was a senior at the time. So um, it they actually didn't start uh, online, their uh, online therapy. They didn't start online classes until the first week of May. So they got out in March and then they didn't start again until the first week second week in May, gave them a couple of weeks, gave them some assignments and that was it. So I think her overall concern was, what am I going to do about going into college? You know, um, how it was gonna affect her. Everything was all over the place. It's Grace, she's, uh, she had a 3.2, but still like ones where she had a C and she wanted to kind of make up some assignments and that wasn't always optional, but they didn't weigh that against the kids. But I think, um, depending on the district and the age of the kids, it impacted them on missing out on clumps of information when they were gonna to go to the next grade or go to the next level. And then two, she's in it now in college. And even on that side of the, uh, you know, aside from like secondary school, primary school, um, 
she's struggling. And I've heard a lot of college kids say that because the professors who already just kind of don't really teach, we've all had one. Um, they're on there. She sent me a picture of them. You know, the psychology professor had her cat in her hand, you know, and they're talking about the cat. And she's just like, oh, my God. And she, she participates a lot. She would show me on her um, camera and she's the main one talking but nobody else is saying anything to the point where they're like, okay, anybody other than Jasmine, can we get somebody else? So she's more of a, uh, she needs to be face to face. And um, she doesn't like the whole online thing. That's just not her. She likes to really be engaged with her classes. So for some kids, I think, and that I mean, as a parent, um, I feel for her because it's her freshman year. It's definitely not the same. Um, it affects her learning and I just worry about that part, especially when she's trying to get a degree in a major where she absolutely kind of has to have the master's. So that's one of the concerns I think on this end as a parent, you know, watching a child kind of struggle through school because this platform isn't necessarily uh, easy for everybody. And there's a lot of kids like that. She said she's had so many friends who are salutatorians and valedictorians of their classes and they calling each other crying because they're struggling doing the online school. So us as parents have often voiced our opinion, you know, about, um, you know, what's going on with the professors and how they're teaching them. And then on this other side that we're paying so much money for them to go to a university and they're not getting the education that they should. They're just giving them anything and then penalizing them on a great level. So I think on my end, as a parent who has an older child, that's kind of my concern, you know, on other end. Jerome, you had your hand uh, up. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Uh, good evening. Um, got into the chat a little late, um, but I'm glad you did ask the question about um, from a parent's perspective. And salute to all the teachers. Y'all get all my respect before then, but especially in this pandemic year, you have your work cut out for you. Uh, so uh, my biggest uh, deal with this pandemic year being a dad. I'm a um, single dad of three daughters. One's in middle school, one's in high school, one's in, um, just graduated um, from HBCU and is going into a master's program. Um, one of the biggest things I noticed, um, there was I noticed a disconnect with my children, the minor children, where they really weren't like, trying to come over and stuff like they normally do every other weekend and come kick it with me and stuff. And it kind of did something to me. I'm a hands-on father. And um, I was wondering what's something going on, you know, was the ex, you know, pumping some poison or whatever. And, um, but, you know, we're approachable and I'm like, what's going on? She say, hey, the kids just kind of doing their own thing or whatever. Um, my kids are open, but they came and told me, they said, dad, this online thing, and all three of my daughters do good, do well academically. And thank God they're still doing well. But they had to break it down and say, dad, this is so stressful for us having the transition online. We're not seeing our friends, this, that, and the other. So it's a little bit of a task for us to have to pack up and come to you on the weekend and blah, blah, blah and everything, and it just hit me, I was blindsided, because I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I was really kind of in my feelings, like what's going on? And when they said that, I was like, wow. So this thing hits on so many levels, much more than, you know, we could probably would have ever thought of or whatnot. So thank God they're still doing well, but it was a big adjustment. So now that we got that out in the air, what was the issue? I'll make a point to go and kick it with them on Saturday to Sunday instead of like Friday and everything and make sure everybody's cool or during the week, bring them some dinner or whatever, when normally we used to going out at least during the week or whatever it is. So it's been a big adjustment, uh, I would say for all families, maybe some more than others, but it's been an adjustment um, one way or the other. Um, the other thing I was going to add, and this isn't, um, I'm not so happy about it, but it will be addressed. Um, my middle schooler, she's about to go to high school um, next year. So the middle schooler and the high schooler will be in school again one more time. Um, so they're not going to have a eighth grade dance or whatever you call it. So my college kid in the high school, they're going to kind of do something for her, you know, doll her up, take her out to eat, which is great. Great for the camaraderie or the siblings. But um, one of the middle school, my, my middle school is my youngest daughter's teacher, um, white male, um, was a little upset because the kids were kind of over talking on Zoom the other day. And he made reference to the police brutalities and stuff and saying like they kind of got what they deserved because they weren't behaving, which I don't understand what, what, what that has to do with the contents of a class. So um, anyway, my daughter, she's outspoken. She 
had a conversation with him about it. He didn't like it. So um, my ex-wife and I, we will be sending an email to the school. So I'm still trying to figure out what police brutality and everything else got to do with the classroom, virtually or in person. But um, and we are sure to address it. Um, so that's all I got. I know even though I said that my daughter was doing great academically, I will say that it's been a struggle because she hasn't been able to truly enjoy her senior year. You know, they've kind of snatched away everything. So, you know, even with the, um, there's, it's still up in the air on how the graduate, what the graduation is going to even look like. But um, I mean, it's, I think that it's, it's, even last year, I know Camilla had a son that graduated last year and he also, you know, missed out on his prom and stuff like that. And it's just, it's just hard, hard for the kids. You know, they, they, it's just out of the norm and things that they're not used to. We all had our senior prom and, you know, those Friday night light football games and different things like that. And they've kind of snatched all of that because um, they was trying to do the football thing still, but something happened and the entire football team test positive for COVID. So that was it. So now they have snatched and um, snatched everything out of the school. So it's almost like there's no social aspect of school or even any memories for them to have. Oh, I'm a senior. You know, when you was a senior, that was the big thing now, you know, but it's like, they don't feel like that. They just feel like, oh, okay, I'm 18 now. I guess I'll just move on. So that's kind of sad too. Where do you all see your kids socially? Um, yeah, of course, you know, with, with uh, the technology and the phones, the social skills already are out the door. People aren't really used to having that one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face conversation. You know, everybody's texting, they'll text in the next room to somebody, or they may FaceTime or whatever, but like socially, where are the kids? And now do you see your kids being more introverted now? than anything? Uh, I was speaking with um, a couple of coworkers because we brought that up. You know, they really weren't communicating very much uh, before because they were always on their phone texting. So there wasn't a lot of everybody outside until the streetlights come on and then we go back in the house. But the one thing that you can count on was the fact that they were going to school and they didn't have their phones. So they had to communicate. They had to learn how to formulate a sentence. They had to learn how to speak to someone else and yes i know like a lot of people the bullying one that's a huge thing too not being bullied because you're virtual or being bullied because you're virtual and they looking at the, your house and they feel like your house is not up to par so then you have a whole different kind of bullying going on there so socially the kids definitely some of them are struggling i know my son he's been on campus with me because i don't have anybody at home for him to be able to stay with. So he had to go to work because I had to go to work. Well, he made friends. And the thing is, the kids were coming back, you know, in sections. So you may get one kid this week, and then maybe at the end of the semester, you might get two more kids. Well, that connection that he formed with that one kid, and he's thinking, oh, this is my best friend. Now, when the new kids come and their friends, it's like, wait a minute, he's my friend. And so instead of them forming those relationships at the beginning of the year where they're all able to, you know, all play together and be friends, it's like, okay, well, no, we're the friends that were here first and you're the new friend who just got here. So you need to make sure that, you know, you're in that group and we're in this group. So I've seen a lot of that and he's in second grade. To just kind of um, tie in some things that I've heard some people say, like, Parents, I know there are some parents who want to help and are very concerned about their children's academics. And what I always tell parents, my advice to parents is always, and it has been for 17 years, you do the fun learning at home. What color are your Skittles? What color are your lifesavers? Let's count, let's jump, let's play hopscotch on the sidewalk or in the driveway. Like you make learning fun. And as far as the parents, I am a parent of a college student. She struggles. She needs her in-person classes. That was not an option for any of her classes. I said, how are you going to take this chemistry lab virtually? And so they did end up going to do only the labs, but it was in shifts. So all of them weren't even there. And so schools were trying 
And as a school leader, that too is one of my hats. I'm the parent and family engagement person. And so I want parents to talk to their kids because we do use our devices a lot. And so each month since October, we've been sitting home a family, parent and family engagement activity for your family to talk about, discuss, do at home. We send all the materials that you need to do it, whether you choose to do it or not. And then your kid brings it back and we display it in the school for the month. And then we take it down at the end of the month and we do it again. And when I first had the idea, because I was told these parents at this school, they don't participate in stuff like that. And I said, okay, well, let me try it. Let me send it home. Let me try it. October for Red Ribbon Week, like 95% of the students brought it back. And so it has started kind of to dwindle down, but now it's like baseball is back on. So like everybody everywhere around here is playing it because that's all we can do. <laughs> and so, but the parents have been very supportive of the monthly activities. And a couple parents have even said like, I love it. You know, we can't come to the school, but we can sit down at the dinner table because I literally say that every month, like sit down and discuss such and such and such with your child. And then think about how you would execute this activity and send it back and we're going to put it up in the hall like every month a different way and so parents have told me you know I love the monthly activities because it does give us something to talk about I am talking with my kids because I did like another thing that I suggest to parents is like talk to your kids we're we you would be surprised at how many things they don't know that we just assume they know because we know them. like I was subbing I had the opportunity to sub in the fifth grade class this year at my school. And we play I Spy. And, you know, I Spy with my little eyes, something orange. And so I'm trying to get the fifth graders to describe orange things that they see in this classroom to try to figure out the thing that I'm spying. And they were like, you know, that, this, mm -mm, what is that? What is this? And they didn't have the social skills to tell me and they were the fifth graders. And so, I, and as a parent and an aunt, I'm trying to be more aware, like, do they know that that's a cabinet? Do they really know that this is a microwave? Like we just assume a lot. So we need, parents should be making education fun at home, use everything you can and do just the fun way and talking to our kids. Like there has to be a time when no one is on their devices and we're just having talking time. That's good. Uh, Stucky, do you have any advice that you would like to give out, you know, to the parents um, from your educational standpoint? Um, what I would say, you know, to the parents is all you can do is your best. You know, right now we live in a we live in an era, we're in a day and time where everybody can only do their best. And you can't do any more than just that but you have to do something, <laughs> you know, you can't say, you can't do nothing and then say, and then complain or have all this gripe to say about what's going on, unless you're involved in it and trying to make a difference when it comes to your kids. I think parents forget that sometimes that, you know, you are your child's first teacher. Yeah, this is our career. We show up every day because this is our career and we're going to do the best we can for your child but you are your child's initial teacher. So all I would say is just continue to push and just try to continue to do your best for the betterment and the, and the success for your children. Ms. Ricks, do you have anything that you would like to leave? We're getting ready to wrap it up, but definitely want to uh, get some final words from you all as educators. No, I just, you know, like Tiffany said, talking to our kids and having fun with them. Cause I think a lot of time we fuss about things, but we just don't take the time out to just have fun, play a game. A simple game of Uno can reveal a whole lot, you know, just in your home, how they deal with interaction when they lose, just teaching on just the level of, you know, how do you react when you lose? as a parent, because you know, Uno is, can get real thick around here, you know? So just playing a game, I suggest everybody at least once a week, try to play a game with your family, just sit down and have that family time when you're not 
focus on anything other than the people that are there with you because at the end of the day especially if you all are at home a lot or can't get out because of covid you have all you have are each other so you want to be able to build that family unit so if nothing else they can come out of this and say because I've heard my kids say, well, when we couldn't go to school, my daddy was home every day and we played games and we rode our bikes and we did this and we did that. Like those experiences are things, those are some of the moments that some of these children are going to remember forever because before that dad worked uh, all day or out of town or whatever, and they never got that opportunity. So just spending that quality time with your family can make a huge difference. Thank you ladies for this. It was great. Yes, ma'am. I've enjoyed all of it. Now, uh, guys, uh, you all that uh, it's your first time on here, we have people that are usually on here um, every week. So I'm going to open the floor for them um, in case they want to say something. Miss Brittany, you have anything that you would like to say to the educators? Thank you. Um, I don't have any children myself, but my mom, she is going into her 20th year and she works with special needs children. Um, so all of this that you ladies have shared today, and I mean, she, I wish that she would have been on today, but I mean, it, it's just, I'm keeping you all in prayer and hoping that God gives you the strength to continue on because, you know, teachers really don't get the recognition that they need, but time and time again, you know, you all are the ones that are keep pushing and trying to motivate the children. So I know it's difficult. I salute each of you. And uh, just thank you. I've learned a lot um, by you all just sharing your story. So I appreciate you for taking the time to do that. I think, you know, uh, um, in the past, we've heard a lot of people talk about the teachers and, you know, they talk about what well, teachers aren't teaching and they aren't doing this. You know, the parents have so much to say. I think that everyone has a newfound respect for educators. Now, even if it's the worst educator, you understand that that educator was your babysitter. They made sure that your child ate every day. They gave them a couple of meals. You know, they made sure that they did some of the homework and things before they even got to the house. So they actually took a good load of, you know, things off of you as a parent before they even got home. So you have no choice but to respect teachers because I was talking to someone, it might've been Nicole uh, Keela, one of them, and they were talking about how even during the school year, their curriculum has changed five times. You know, just trying to adjust to everything that has taken place. That's a lot of time to change the curriculum. You know, I, I, I've taught at uh, Gwinnett Tech teaching barbering and just setting up a curriculum and and doing an agenda, that's a lot of work. And I'm like, how in the world do they do this? Because you actually have to always think ahead. So when they bring something in the middle of the year and say, okay, we got to insert this and we need you to take this out. Then you got to go back, take everything you did, try to scramble it together, take this out. It's just a whole lot. So, you know, we, we definitely appreciate you all as educators. And the majority of you have been doing it over 15 years. That's a long time to deal with somebody else's kids and then come home and deal with your own kids. Y'all all need a raise. <laughs> y'all need a couple of raises. <laughs> but but definitely, we appreciate y'all. Uh, Tyree, do you have anything that you would like to say? He, he might have slid out. Marla, do you have anything else that you want to say? No, I'm good. I'm just happy to kind of be here. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. We thank you for joining us. And guys, I have my mother on the line. She's been listening, and I know she has something that she wants to say. Miss Joanne, Mom, do you have anything that you would like to say today? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. My hat is off. To good evening, everyone. It's so nice to meet the ones that I have not uh, met before. My head is off to you all. But you know one thing, there's always something for somebody to do, even with myself. Um, the only thing I can do is pray for you all because you all have something to deal with. This is totally a new generation, a different breed generation. And it's totally different from even when I raised Kaya and her twin sister. Now, when they became three years old, 
uh, it was a, I'm, I'm just one block from the middle school here in Newton. Now, when they became three years old, they would come home, uh, even from school after the tutoring. I took them to this lady, this teacher, right up the street at three. And uh, her name is Vordia Evans. And I asked her, I said, listen, how old do they need to be before you start teaching them from books? She said, how old? I said, three. She said, right now. So I paid her to get them ready for school. Cause you know one thing, when I graduated in 65, the typewriter had, they had just introduced the typewriter in Newton, the little pet thing, you know, here and there. So I didn't learn how to type. So they come home with a little lesson and I'm saying, whoa, what is this? Cause to tell you the truth, I didn't like school, no way. But uh, I didn't have anybody really at home to uh, nurture me and tutor me on that wise, because I had to go to the field, uh, pick cotton and feed the pigs and get the eggs and farm girl, country, straight up country. So my hat is off to you all. And I am going to be praying they had already been praying, but listening to you all, see, my mind is always open to hear. Uh, even the words say, he that has an ear, let him hear. So to listen to what you all are going through, what you're saying, what the children are going through, and it is something to deal with. And I want to say to each and every one, I, I, one of you, I love you with a godly love. Keep doing what you're doing. And I'm going to keep all of you and the children all over this world lifted and undergirded in prayer because certainly prayer can change things. Prayer can change the, some of these parents. Like you always saying that don't even care. Just get these kids out of the house because they running me crazy. But see, we don't think about that when we're having babies. But somebody got to have babies. I'm just so glad mine are on their own. They're grown and gone. <laughs> And I love them with the realness. You hear what I'm saying? It's so nice to meet you all. Please keep doing what you're doing. And remember, Sister Jo is going to keep you in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to close it out, but I'm going to let you, uh, Mom, in a few minutes, I'm going to let you uh, um, end with the closing prayer. But ladies, thank you all for joining. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, we have a, it's, been, it's so long since we, you know, really gotten together. We're going to have to do this a little more often. I got plenty of subjects that I can pull out, uh, you know, but I definitely enjoy hearing you all. You know, it's amazing. You can be with people at a certain time and then you can, um, you know, watch them grow and then come back years later. And their, you know, whole, their mindset is different because of the experiences that they've gone through. But I want to tell, I want to motivate each one of you to continue to be encouraged, you know, regardless of what's going on. Stay encouraged, you know, because you never know who's using your life as a blueprint for theirs. You all think that we're just going to work every day. Somebody is, some of those kids and maybe the parents as well, they're looking at the, the pattern that you're setting and they're using that to help them to become the, a better person, to be who they need to be, you know, uh, because a lot of people, we don't, they don't really have examples in front of them. So educators are always on that platform to be examples. So I, I definitely thank each and every one of you. And Ms. Ricks, thank you for coming on. I don't know who invited you, but definitely appreciate you for coming on and giving your input. It was, it was all good. I enjoyed everything that came about. So without further ado, Mother, I'm going to let you unmute and close us in prayer. Are there any special prayer requests? From anyone? I have one. Okay. I have a prayer Here's request. A... Um, I have my middle son is actually in the hospital. He's in the military and he's actually in the hospital as we speak, basically fighting for his life. So if you can lift him up in prayer, that would be very awesome. What's his name? His name is Daryl. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, ma'am. My, okay. I'm sorry. My my um, my nephew my nephew Jared and my uncle Vic. My uncle Vic is in the hospital, and my nephew Jared is um just kind of going through some things. So just ask for prayer for both of them, please. 
You say Vic. Yeah, my, my uncle's name is Victor. Vic. Okay. And uh, my okay. nephew's name is Jared. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this hour, for this very moment. For watching over us all last, last night, Lord, I thank you. I praise you and I honor you, Lord, because truly thou art the breath of life. For everyone that's on this panel, Lord Jesus, far and near, Lord, I ask you to touch. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch the educators, touch the children, Lord Jesus, touch their minds and their hearts, Jesus. Cause them to want to learn, Lord. All we need, all they need is a touch from you, Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus, to stand fast and stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for every open door. I thank you for that that you're going to do, Lord. Lord, I praise your holy name. Lord, fix whatever needs to be fixed. Help broken heart. Jesus, when we get weary, Lord Jesus, be our comfort. Because knowing that you are our comfort, oh Lord Jesus, you know you are our leader and our guide, Lord, and I thank you. I ask you, Lord, to order our steps in your word. In the, in the school system, Lord, order steps, Jesus. Settle minds, Jesus. Ease tension. Comfort hearts, Lord Jesus. Almighty God, I praise you, knowing that all things, all good things come from heaven above. Lord, I praise you today because there is nothing happening out of your will. Help us, Lord, to seek you in all our ways, Jesus, to come to you, Jesus. You said acknowledge you in all our ways, Lord, for there we will find peace and joy and happiness and strength, Lord. Strengthen where we're weak. Build us up where we're torn down, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for keeping everybody on this panel, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, comfort hearts, Lord. Lord, I ask you to touch Daryl, Jesus. Touch him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Lord Jesus, work out every situation, Jesus. Comfort everything that needs to be comforted within his body, Jesus. I rebuke sickness and disease, Jesus, infirmities. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask you to touch Gerald, Jesus. Touch their minds, Lord. Touch his mind, Father. Regulate Jesus. Put everything in place where it needs to be, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. You even know every hair that's on our head, Lord Jesus. Almighty God, Jesus, minister to his spirit, Lord. Touch Vic, Lord Jesus. Almighty God, mighty God, comfort, Lord Jesus. Heal, Jesus. Satan, the Lord rebuke you, and the blood of Jesus is against you. You have no power here. I bind the will of the enemy and bring every one of his works to naught. Hallelujah, Jesus. I come against every evil spirit, every hindering force, every foul demon, knowing that Satan is out to destroy our children. But I bind him in the name of Jesus. Let thy blood prevail, for the blood, Jesus, there is healing in the blood. Lord, and I praise you and I thank you, Jesus. Jesus calls us to rest tonight. When we lay down to slumber and sleep, Lord Jesus, be our peace. Thank you, Lord, for the angels that you have encamped around about us, Lord Jesus. Keep us from all hurt, harm, and danger. I rebuke every disease, every sickness, every infirmity, Lord Jesus. Heal, deliver, and set free, Jesus. Cause peace to come within our hearts and within our spirits, Lord. Help us to look to the hills from which cometh our help. Hallelujah, Jesus. Help us to rest in thee. Help us to seek thee in all our ways, Lord. And I praise you, Jesus. All the glory and all the honor is thine, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I will not take your glory. Neither will I even dare to share in it because it all belongs to you, Jesus. Lord, keep us, Lord, because we can't keep ourselves. Lord Jesus, keep our children. Hallelujah, Jesus. Keep our children saved right now, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mother, for covering us. 
and our families. And guys, uh, this is your first time joining us. We're here every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. So definitely do not let it be your last time coming. And remember, I love you all, and there is nothing that you can do about it. So take care, be blessed, and we'll catch up with you all later on. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed. Thank you, Kaya. Have a good night. Yeah. Likewise.